one. Hello, welcome to Solar Energy International. Um, we're very glad you've chosen us for your renewable energy education. SEI, Solar Energy International, we've been doing this since 1991. Um, and our mission really is to provide industry-leading technical training and expertise in renewable energy to empower people, communities, and businesses worldwide. The reason why we do it, because we envision a world powered by renewable energy. And I imagine that you're here watching this presentation because you do too. My name is Brian Mahalik. I have been an SEI instructor for around seven years now, and I'm an SEI grad class of 2002. Got my start in the solar industry, um, getting training from SEI, and then quickly uh, moved into doing installation and design and service and troubleshooting, and I've been at it ever since. Um, I work about two-thirds of my time for SEI to spend the rest of my time working for various contractors and utilities and, and writing for various trade magazines. And uh, you'll probably end up reading a few of my articles as you go through, uh, go through some of our coursework. So again, welcome Solar Energy International. Um, we've been doing this since 1991, as I mentioned. Um, we are a nonprofit 501c3, and as of this year, we have uh, officially crossed the mark of over 35,000 people trained, and that really is all over the world. Uh, the international part um, isn't just there because it sounds good. We truly operate all over the world. Um, we'll be mostly focusing on PV, photovoltaics, or solar electric. Um, but SEI does cover a wide range of renewable energy sources, um, sources such as wind or micro hydro that we also teach classes on. Um, and of course, we, all of our curriculum will always uh, focus on efficiency first. It is always, always cheaper to not use energy than have to generate it. And that's even true with the remarkable reductions in cost of, of our various renewable energy systems that we've seen over the course of the last few years. So efficiency is always key. We can talk about different resources in terms of capturing energy and, and, and making energy. But if we can do that in an efficient manner, um, that makes everything a little bit easier. Part of that really is the whole building approach, realizing that, you know, you can't just slap a system on a poorly built building um, and, and, and expect it to be very efficient. Um, things such as insulation, um, existing buildings can have their insulation improved. Um, we can upgrade the, the amount of insulation going into new buildings, um, taking advantage of passive thermal design, solar thermal design, so that we use um, the uh, properly uh, sized windows and overhangs to catch the, uh, the heat in the sun, sun's uh, energy during the months of the year when we need heat inside. And then those overhangs keep the sun out during the times of the year when we want to keep the building cooler. Um, and of course, there's various techniques we can use, um, ranging from things such as straw bale and, and adobe and, and other techniques that are out there. Um, but in the end, realizing that, you know, the built environment does consist of a lot of traditional type structures, um, we can put solar thermal systems on them that make hot water and solar electric systems that can offset some or even all or even more of their electrical use. Um, and that, but in the end, we really need to make sure that we're approaching these with, with a holistic approach and doing things as simple as hanging clothes out to dry or replacing old light bulbs or old refrigerators and appliances. And, and this really applies from, from across all ranges of, of, of buildings, everything from, from, from a house or even an apartment where maybe you're changing out incandescent bulbs for more efficient compact fluorescence, um, all the way up to, to, to large commercial facilities that, that may do a combination approach where they'll put a solar system on a building, but at the same time, they'll also upgrade old machinery or lighting systems um, and reduce the, the energy that the building uses while at the same time um, generating energy as well through a, through a solar electric system. Um, and, and in the end, what ends up happening is that they end up offsetting a larger percentage of the energy they would have been using because they're using less than they were. So, so it's always important to keep this whole building approach in mind, or, or in some cases, maybe a whole system approach. It may be something as simple as hey, a, a small water pumping system. And using an efficient pump will allow a smaller PV system to be used, um, which can reduce the cost and, and can, be, can be a key consideration. So, so always keep that in mind um, that, that it's easier to, to not have to use power than, than to generate it in, in most cases. So 
Yeah. SDI, uh, over the last couple of years, um, you know, certification in the industry has been a big deal. Um, and so SCI has launched its Solar Professional Certificate Program, um, both for uh, students in the U.S. As, as well as internationally. And, and the idea here really is to, to train people um, not to a test, right? There are, there's various certification exams out there that you can take. Um, but what we really are pushing at SCI is the idea that, hey, there's a lot to learn and being a well-rounded student is just as important as learning enough, or probably more important really, than just learning enough to be able to pass a certification exam. I know that personally, you know, after, you know, over a de well over a decade in this industry, I'm still learning all the time. And, and I'm so glad that I started my, my, my career out taking basically all the courses that the guy had to offer. Um, I felt that gave me such a well-rounded base and such a solid, solid grasp of the fundamentals as, as well as getting exposure to so many people that have had so much experience in the industry. So um, contact uh, SEI if you want more information about the Solar Professional Certificate Program. It, it's basically like a, like a, a selection of our courses that, that lead to, a, to our certificate um, based on the, the track you want to take, whether you're working strictly on battery-based systems or maybe you're aiming at more being a sales professional or a, or, or, or a solar thermal professional. Um, so, so let us know and uh, we can help you. And I think it also gives our students good guidance on just what of our classes make sense based on what your career goals are. Um, some of the certifications that are out there, um, NABCEP is, is probably the most well-known certification. Um, the entry-level exam is not actually a certification. It's, it's really just kind of a way to say, hey, I've got some baseline level, level education. I'm interested in this. I, I, I was able to take and pass a test. Um, and I think it's something that kind of looks really good on your resume if you're looking to get a, get a foot in a door somewhere. Um, full NABCEP certification itself, whether it's for a, a, a PV installer, or PV sales, or solar heating installer, um, really is designed for people that either have, um, a, well, a combination of factors, both um, experience in the industry, maybe experience as an electrician, um, a more significant amount of education um, to, to meet, meet the minimum requirements, or other licensing, uh, whether it's through a state uh, or other organization that, 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 that sort of meets the, the baseline qualifications to sit for the exam. So I would encourage you to go to the NABSEB website to see about what those different requirements are. Um, you know, basically, it's not just a 40-hour class <laughs> or, or, or our PV 101 online class um, if, unless you have a lot of other experience already. And the SEI registration staff can also um, help you if you have questions about uh, what exactly, what classes you should take or, or how your, your previous experience may fit in in terms of sitting for the NABSEP certification. Um, I'm, I'm NABSEP certified since, I think, 2000 and eight, 2008, I believe, and it was a pretty hard test, and I'll tell you, the, the education I got at SEI was absolutely critical to me passing that test, as well as the experience I gained in the field over three or four years before I took the test, and <laughs> let's, not, let's not kid here, the, the tremendous amount of studying I did before I took it as well. So it really is a, um, uh, it's a certification that if you have, I think it, it's very valuable and it, it really means that you're among the cream of the crop. But at the same time, it may not, and in many, most cases, will not allow you to actually install a system. You know, most jurisdictions, whether it's a state or a city or a county, require some sort of, of, of local license, whether it's an electrical contractor, general contractor, um, or solar specific contractor license in order to be able to install systems. So, so that, that's, a, that's in addition to an NAPSEP certification. And in many places, you'll have installers that aren't NAPSEP certified, but they have these other licenses that allow them to install. I think if you're comparing apples to apples, um, a, a, a company or a, an individual with a NAPSEP certification as well as the requisite licensing um, that the authority having jurisdiction or AHJ requires it would certainly always be a preferred choice. Um, and so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, RISE is the, uh, the uh, Certified Solar Roofing Professionals Program. Um, for the, it's, uh, RISE stands for the Roof Integrated Solar Energy Organization. And this is really a collaboration um, with, with, with roofing contractors because you know, they know the roofs better than any, almost any PV installer. Um, and working with them so that there's a certification for the installation side there as well. Maybe not so much the electrical side, but as, as we'll see, there's a lot of mechanical side, uh, work that goes into these systems. And anytime you're up on somebody's roof, you know, you're either, 
you, you bought it basically, right? If you're the last person up there, if there's a leak, they're gonna assume it's you and you wanna make sure that you, that you maintain the warranty on an existing roof. So, so integration with, with, with the roofers and, and, and training of roofers is, is critical to the continued growth of the PV industry. Um, UL, United, uh, uh, the Underwriters Lab, which uh, certifies products for safety, also has a PV system installer certification. Um, that requires a level of education and, as well as being a uh, licensed electrician. So that's really uh, uh, kind of brings together. It's not NABSEP plus licensed, but it, it basically is it, something similar to that, essentially. And uh, ulknowledgeservices.com can provide you more information on that certification. So uh, just a quick run through of, of, of sort of what we're looking at in terms of SEI's classes. Um, I know many of you will take more than one class with us. Um, uh, and it may be over the course of years. We have, certainly have students that take one or two classes, get a job in the industry, and, and come back to get higher level training as, as their career advances. So right now you're probably in PV 101, solar electric design and installation. And, and this is really our fundamentals course where we get into what are modules, how do they work, what are the components of various systems, how do we hook PV modules together to make arrays and, and what are some of the design basics to consider and how do we size systems and, and really just a, a really solid baseline fundamental level. Now, it, it, you'll get out of it what you put into it, I'll be totally honest, and a, a lot of people take this class already knowing something about PV and, and they find they get uh, even more out of a 101 class because they're not starting from scratch. And if you are starting from scratch, Take your time, review all the material, please speak up and ask questions. There's a lot to learn and, and I think you'll, you'll end up with a lot of resources that you'll look back on and use as you, as you continue through, uh, through your career in the industry. Um, SEI has an amazing lab facility at our, at our headquarters in Paonia, Colorado on the, on the western slope of the, of the Rockies. Um, and we do lab classes there uh, in the spring, summer, and fall, and we get snowed in in the winter. But, but lab season is phenomenal, and it's really where we get to put our classroom learning um, to practice. And we get uh, groups out there, usually three or four or five students per instructor. We may have uh, up to four or five groups going, and they're taking apart systems. They're putting them back together. They're commissioning them. They're doing performance testing on them. Um, and really just getting a feel for all the different types of products that are out there, different inverters, modules, racking systems, and, uh, and getting this actual hands-on experience with, with, with the products, which is so valuable for so many people. Um, you know, everybody learns different ways, and, and getting that hands-on experience is, 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 an, is an incredible, incredible time. Plus, Paleo Colorado is just a fantastic town to come to. So I would definitely would encourage you, to, if, if you're able to, to, to make it out for, for uh, PV201. This is really is sort of the follow-up hands-on course to PV101. Um, and, and we'll also talk about some of our other lab courses in, in a minute here. Um, Battery-based systems, this for years and years was what PV was. You know, when I, when I started installing systems, it was all off-grid systems, running on batteries, operating standalone systems, people living in the boonies, or maybe it was telecommunication systems in the middle of nowhere or, or various other applications like that. But the fact is, there, as PV has gotten a lot cheaper, modules have come down in price so much, the applications for PV systems that include batteries have just grown tremendously. Um, and, you know, it really is, I think, the mark of a well-rounded professional um, to be able to work on all types of PV systems. Um, knowing that, um, battery-based systems tend to be a lot more complicated than our, than our grid direct systems that we'll focus on in PV 101 and, and, and the type of systems that, that make up, you know, really the biggest PV systems in the world. Um, so battery-based systems are interesting. The applications are, are tremendous. Uh, you know, if you get into it, the opportunity to work all over the world is phenomenal. Um, and so PV203 is really our, is our classroom uh, battery class. And so we, we build on PV101, we build on those concepts, and, and we apply it in terms of designing battery-based systems and maintaining batteries and, and how to size them correctly and, and, and all of these, these details that, that are particular to battery-based systems and that make them so versatile as well as complex. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty heavy class, and, and we also follow that up with our PV301L Lab Week. Again, much like the 201L, this is the hands-on component that builds on our, 
on our classroom time and, and, and students get to work with a variety of battery based systems ranging from small um, DC direct where maybe a, a module runs a fan which is you know that's a very viable application small lighting systems all the way up to complicated off-grid systems or um, AC coupled systems battery backup systems so so that's a that's a really in-depth hands-on week that uh, um, is is full of, of all kinds of different technology and gear and um, is, is a fantastic class. Um, just to look at a few of the other classes we teach, you know, a lot of people need to know about batteries, but they don't want to necessarily dive too heavily into it. Um, PV203 prep is, is sort of like the batteries you need to know to kind of know something about batteries. Um, <laughs> a lot of it is stuff that maybe uh, could be on various certification exams out there. And so you want to know something about these battery-based systems, but you know there's a lot of people in the PV industry that will never touch a battery. Um, so, so this sort of gives you the opportunity to get some of that battery-based system knowledge um, in a shorter online format. Um, PV202 is our advanced PV system design class. It focuses very heavily on the National Electrical Code, um, and it's really about it's about all types of systems, but it, it, it starts to build into um, commercial and, and larger utility scale systems and, and looking at, at different requirements as system size grows um, and, 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 and focusing on codes and, and standards and best practices and doing things right, uh, learning from people that have, 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 have you know, learned from experience, so you're, you're able to learn from, from what they've learned. And so this is really, again, there's, there's some, a, a good deal of math in here when we get into advanced system size and calculations. Um, but it's, it's really a, a great course for a well-rounded system designer and installer as well so that you're aware of what those code requirements are and, and why things need to be how they are. And, and I think that's, that's very valuable. Um, PV206, Solar Business and Technical Sales is our class. Um, really, it's, a, it's sort of a prep for the PV Technical Sales Certification for NABCEP. Um, it touches on um, financing systems, um, uh, doing uh, economic evaluation of, of systems, um, sales techniques, ways to structure a business, um, and, and a lot of, a lot of the, the, the things that people have learned over the years as the solar industry has built has really kind of grown pretty tremendously, you know. Um, when I started in this, it was me and two or three other guys working for a, for a small company, and we kind of did it all. Um, you know, now we're at the point where we've got giant solar integrators that operate all over the world that have hundreds or even thousands of people working for them and, and, and all kinds of different contractors involved and subcontractors. So, so there's a lot of different areas in the, in the solar business uh, that, that didn't, flat out didn't exist not that long ago. Um, and, and so this class is really a good way to look at, at what, that, what happens um, and, and what those opportunities are and, and what you need to know to take advantage of those opportunities and fulfill some of those jobs. You know, everything from running your own business to being uh, tech uh, support for an inverter manufacturer or selling and designing systems um, for an installer, um, a, a wide range of topics that, that are covered in that class. And, um, finally, sort of our, our cream of the crop lab class is PV351L, Tools and Techniques for Operations and Maintenance. This is one of our newer classes and one that I'm particularly excited about. This is the high-level technician training class. Um, it's basically hands-on with the cool, expensive tools. We, we break out insulation resistance testers and all kinds of different irradiance meters and IV curve testers and array commissioning tools and, and all kinds of different multimeters and clamp-on meters. And, and we really run through using these tools and, and, and what procedures are involved in both commissioning systems as well as maintaining and troubleshooting systems. And, and this is just a, is an amazing class. Um, this is our highest level students and um, you know we're working on real live systems sometimes ones that we put faults in so people can find them and, and troubleshoot them and it is just a fantastic learning opportunity that that I've had the pleasure of teaching several times now in various locations um, both at our Paonia lab yard and, and at several other locations across the country. So switching gears for a few minutes, we've been talking solar electric and, you know, really that's become a huge focus of SEI over the last handful of years, again, in large part because of the tremendous reduction in costs of these systems and, and the tremendous demand for them and, and for clean, renewable electricity. But SEI also teaches several other workshops on other renewable energy uh, uh, 
resources and applications. And one that I've got a fair amount of experience with as well is solar hot water or solar thermal, um, which includes pool heating systems. And, um, you know, this is a class we do online and in person. NAPSEP does have a certification for solar hot water systems. And solar hot water is amazing. It's really a lot of bang for your buck. Um, I personally really enjoy plumbing. I like I like sweat and copper pipe together. That's a lot of fun. And, and it's a different application. I think historically, a lot of smaller renewable energy installers kind of did it all. You know, they were, they were plumbers and did solar hot water, and they were electricians and did solar electric. Um, but again, as the industry has grown, there's still, there's still companies out there that do that, but there's also the need for specialization, and, and you can put in some really complicated solar hot water systems that do space heating and, and on an industrial scale and, and uh, process water for, for uh, industrial processes. So the, 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 the range is pretty tremendous, and uh, this class is a fantastic way to, for people that either are are wanting to add this to their business or, or, or want to get into solar hot water or maybe for a plumber who wants to add this to their business um, if they haven't been doing doing solar thermal work before. Um, so I would encourage you to, to check out that class as well. Um, one thing that, that really puts the international and solar energy international is our rural development workshops. And, and you've got to keep in mind that all across the world there's more than one billion people that don't have access to electricity, and I would honestly not be surprised if that number is higher. Um, these are the kind of applications where just a little bit of electricity can make a huge difference, where, um, you know, where we have lighting at nighttime instead of having to use kerosene lanterns. Um, and just the ripple effects of, of, of this can be tremendous. Um, our appropriate technology for the developing world is an online class, and it really focuses on, on implementing these projects in the developing world um, all, all over the world, um, from Africa to Latin America and South America and, and the South Pacific and, 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 and India and other countries as well. Um, and, and it's fascinating work and it's rewarding work, and our instructors are are, are doing it because they're in, in, extremely passionate about it, and they they go to they go to Haiti, and they go to um, you know the, they go to diff, different parts of Western Africa and just all over the world um, to, to 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 basically help people um, improve their lives by giving them electricity, and it may be for water pumping, it may be for a hospital or a, a maternity ward, or it may be for a school. Um, the applications are tremendous. And, and a big part of this is not just flying in and dropping off a bunch of modules and then getting out of there. Really what a, a huge backbone of these projects is making sure that we um, train local technicians and train um, the people who will be using the, the technology and the electricity so that they can grow businesses around taking care of them and, and take care of them to ensure that they operate for years. And, and, and this isn't just a one time, here it is, uh, you know, thanks, see you next time kind of thing. This is really a way to help build a community and, um, and, and, and create jobs and create a lot lasting source of, source of power for, for people who need it really more than anybody else in the world. Um, other work workshops that we do, solar hot water pumping, um, you know, water pumping is, is, is really fascinating and it's, a, it's really definitely is a subset of, of solar electric systems. We're using PV modules, but, but the whole pumping and how much can I pump and how high can I pump it and, and what, how many gallons per minute or gallons per day am I going to get is, is really a, is an art in and of itself and the applications are, are tremendous you know, uh, all over the world. Again, we, we see these in developing world applications. Um, I, I did a lot of water pumping for um, the U.S. Forest Service when I was living and working in Arizona. Um, and, you know, there's people all over the country and all over the world who get their water from wells, whether it's for personal use or for um, irrigation, for agriculture or, or uh, livestock. Um, the, there's tremendous applications here to, to get generators out of the system um, in some cases, or even just to finally get the water up to where people can use it in other applications. Um, our microhydro class is, is, is fascinating. I, I, most of my background been in, was in Arizona, and I didn't have much microhydro because there wasn't a lot of surface water flow. But in, in many areas, um, taking advantage of small streams um, can provide tremendous, tremendous amounts of power because realistically what it is is 24-7, unlike a solar electric system 
the sun, you know where the sun goes down. Um, this, this is providing energy twenty four seven as long as the stream is running. And obviously, um, we need to take care and not disrupt waterways. And, and and we also need to make sure that we build systems that that are reliable. And and these are these are honestly things I don't know a whole lot about. But um, micro hydro is is a very proven um, proven energy source and. Uh, and the instructors that teach that class are, are tremendously experienced in all kinds of different uh, micro hydro designs and applications. SEI over the last couple of years has been expanding our Spanish program. Um, we've, we've gotten some help with some grants as well as the fact that we just know so many people all over the place that we've got good connections. Um, and, and people that are hungry for our training and hungry, hungry for learning more about renewable energy. Um, we've taught classes um, in numerous locations in, in Latin America over the last couple of years. Um, and currently we have online classes, um, FV uh, 101 and 203. Those are sort of our 101 and 203, but in Spanish. Um, and we also do these classes in person as well. Um, if, if you're interested, um, I, would, I would go to our website or else, uh, or else contact registration about upcoming uh, offerings in, in Spanish. Our Native American program um, has been going strong for, for several years, um, or, or longer than that, really. This has kind of been something that SEI has done for years. Um, several of our instructors are, are very passionate about the, these applications um, and, and, and have been working closely with various Native American communities over the years. Um, you know. I, Again, working to, to bring them technical training and get systems installed, but also make sure that people are able to maintain them and operate them and businesses that service these systems grow and basically building a renewable energy um, industry, essentially, um, for, for these different Native American communities in, in conjunction with them. And this has been very rewarding work um, all, all across the United States and various um, with various communities. Um, and, and this is something that, that SEI has been passionate about for years, and, and, and these are very exciting projects, um, bo both in Colorado and, and Nevada and, and, and South Dakota and Montana and, and, and in several other states, um, and we're always looking for more opportunities as well. It's really part of our outreach program. You know, SEI um, really is, is as a, as a nonprofit. You know, we 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 earn most of our income from tuition. And so, thank you as a student. We we greatly appreciate that, and we are, are are very confident you'll feel it's worth it. But the the income that we do earn is we put back into programs such as this. We we, we offer scholarships, um, and, and we fund programs such as the Native American program. Um, internationally, you know, the PV market has been going crazy all over the world, um, and uh, SEI has been participating. We've been in the Middle East. Um, I was in India last year, and I'll be going again this year. Uh, Sierra Leone, Palestine, Pakistan, as I mentioned, um, uh, Latin American countries, Barbados, Cuba, Haiti, and Solomon Islands, and, and really the list just keeps going. There's so many tremendous opportunities to partner sh with different organizations and groups all over the world. Um, and and the, the thing that SCI really brings to the table is the ability to help people with all types of PV systems, ranging from the simplest, smallest systems up to giant utility scale systems. Um, this is something that I've seen firsthand in India. The market there is growing incredibly fast and, and we're getting a lot of people installing giant systems that don't have a lot of experience in PV. And, and it's uh, very rewarding to be able to connect with these people and, and help them get some training to help ensure that the systems they're putting in are gonna, are gonna um, be high quality and, and last for years and years. Um, so this is rewarding work, and um, we've got SEI instructors and alumni all over the world, and that really enables us to, uh, to make these connections and, and operate in so many different countries. So those are, that's, those are some of our classes. Let's talk a little bit about PV. We just want to have kind of an overview of, of, of PV, photovoltaics, solar electricity, kind of a general overview. Um, take a look at where the industry is grow, uh, going and, and growing, <laughs> and then uh, and then we'll dive into some of the uh, some of our some of our coursework here shortly. So some of the advantages of photovoltaics: one, first off, no fuel costs. Right, sun falls equally and freely on everybody everywhere across the world. Well, not equally, but 
that sunshine is pretty predictable at least. Right? We've got years and years of, of data from various sources that allow us to be pretty accurately predict how much solar resource is going to fall on a particular site. Now some data sets are better than others and of course weather is always going to change a little bit and, and be variable from year to year. But in general we're able to forecast the amount of energy a system is going to make with some uh, reasonable expectation of, of, of variability. Um, Low maintenance, that, that's a huge one here. Unlike most energy sources, there are no moving parts in PV systems, um, with the exception of some systems that may have trackers and, and they actually track the sun and, and, and that's the rack moves that way. But in general, the maintenance is, is really low. Um, there's no, uh, you know, there's no engines to, to overhaul or oil to change or, or um, any, anything like that. There are electronics and, you know, electronics can fail. And, and you know, the, the, one, the one myth that's kind of been there over the, over the years is that PV is really plug and play, set it and forget it. And, and as we see more and more installations, that's not true. Doing a really good job designing a system um, it can help with that, and doing a good job installing it can help with that, but it, these systems do still require some maintenance. So we say low maintenance, not no maintenance, but compared to most electricity sources, it is, it is much lower. Um, one thing that, that you'll learn pretty quickly is that PV is really modular. It really is. You know, a 2,000-watt system on somebody's roof has a lot of similarities to a 2-megawatt system sitting on 10 acres of, of, of ground. Um, and connected at the utility level. It's very modular. We, we take modules and we build circuits and, and we, we, we figure out what the voltage and current's going to be and then we just hook more and more of those circuits together. And, and big inverters kind of do the same thing as small inverters. And um, So, it, you know, that's why it's so important to have a really good grasp of the fundamentals because it's modular. We're going to build on them, right? And we're going to get to the point of being able to do all kinds of big, crazy, amazing things. And um, it really comes from understanding the, the building blocks of how this stuff goes together. What, one great thing about PV is it's really reliable. And part of that goes back to the no moving parts. Um, and, you know, if you look at a PV module, most of them these days have a 25-year warranty on them. Um, and, you know, you got to read the fine print, of course. That's usually after 25 years, they'll, they'll still be making 80% of, the, of their original power. But, you know, that's the fine print. And every warranty has that. In general, they're very reliable, though. Um, and, and, and that, again, goes back to the low maintenance thing, too. So, you know, we've learned over the years, the technology itself hasn't changed that much. The actual cell inside a PV module that captures photons in the sun and, and creates electricity hasn't changed a lot in the last 20 or 30 years. But manufacturing processes have gotten better other materials such as the the back sheets that go behind the cells and and the uh, the framing and and the glass in terms of how much it reflects and how much it transmits those have all gotten those have all gotten incrementally better um, but we're using you know part of that is like you know sometimes people will be like well hey this is old technology if the cells are the same thing we've been using for 25 years well you know the the flip side to that is it's proven right so We've been using cells that are similar to how they have been for the last three decades. Well, in a certain sense, that's a bit of a piece, bit of peace of mind when you're buying a product that actually has a 25-year warranty, right? A 25-year warranty isn't worth a whole lot if it's only something that's been being made for two or three years. So we've got a track record, and that 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 points to reliability. Um, silence and no emissions, and that that's really you know part of that is is. Uh, is part of the whole point of renewable energy, right? No emissions as compared to a generator. Uh, PV in particular is silent. You know, you can hear a wind turbine spinning. You can hear a microhydro uh, turbine spinning. Um, PV just sits there and does its thing. It does its thing. Maybe if it's really windy, you might hear the wind whistle through it a little bit. Um, but, but it does its thing. And, and, you know, I think for years that's been the appeal of it. Historically, this industry started with small off-grid systems, people getting back to the land, people in the middle of nowhere. And what did you not want? You didn't want a generator running, disturbing the peace and quiet. Plus, you got to change the oil and you got to feed it gas and it's stinky and, and it can be dangerous to store the gas and that sort of thing. So, you know, that, that, that inherently has always been one of the, uh, the, uh, the advantages and appeals of, of, of PV modules. 
So just to look at a little bit of history, uh, 1954, Bell Lab developed the first viable PV cells. Um, and then, hey, four years later, they were already in space, right? A small array uh, power a radio system on a satellite. And, you know, it's another one of those hey, space age spinoff kind of things. We, we, uh, it, it, Going, going back to it, it's, uh, we've, got, we've got the NASA people to thank a little bit and the Bell Lab people to thank a little bit. Um, and at that, at that point, really, the only use for this was something that was so exotic that it was going to go into outer space because it was just too darn expensive. Um, you know, and, and that changed over time, and, and early applications included things such as buoys, right? Out in the middle of nowhere, um, you can't run electricity to it, it's in the water. It's bobbing out there in a harbor or a shipping lane. Um, so you put a battery in there and that runs it, but then you gotta go out to it on a boat and change the battery. So, you know, that was quickly seen as an early application for, um, for, for, for PV, keep that battery topped off. Maybe, it, maybe it's not enough to run it all the time, but uh, it's enough to extend the life of it, right? And so we saw this with telecommunication systems, um, telephone repeater stations or radio st repeater st stations that are, that are in the middle of nowhere and it's, it was expensive and time consuming to get to them to, to replace batteries or to bring more fuel for generators and service the generators. So those were those kind of off-grid applications where there's no utility grid um, were, were one of the early, uh, early uses for PV modules. Um, so you see things like, uh, hey, check out, check it out. There's a there's a lighthouse there, right? And it's got a PV array on it. Um, so that's that's helping um, with uh, the uh, with 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 running the light there. Um, and we see these applications all over the place. You know, I think that highways and railroad crossings, things that are, you know, there's just it's not financially viable to run electricity to uh, to this thing. There's not there's not a, a utility service anywhere nearby. Um, it's in the middle of nowhere, and it also demands reliability, right? And, and that goes back to one of the advantages of PV. This is a very reliable energy store source. We can charge a battery. We know how long we can charge that, how long that battery will last when it's fully charged, how often we'll be able to get it fully charged. So, so those, those are great applications. And again, with the, the decrease in costs, we've seen these springing up all over the place. Um, some other early applications, you know, uh, street signs, another one where it, it was cheaper to put in, uh, put in a PV array to run the, the lighting on the, on the billboard rather than, than run an electrical service to it. Um, you know, uh, applications like sailboats and RVs, these were, these were, uh, tremendous early adopters and, and, and this PV still is a, plays a huge role in, in these, uh, applications. Um, I got a PV module on the top of, on the roof of my RV. It keeps the battery charged up, and um, you see them on sailboats all over the world. And then another popular application, again, as a standalone application, would be water pumping for livestock. You know, they're pretty much in the middle of nowhere, and there may be water below ground. Um, but again, it's just not practical to run electricity to it, or it's or it's too expensive to have a generator out there that needs to be moved around to other sites. Um, so these kind of standalone applications um, drove a lot of the early use of PV, but also continue to be big applications to this day. So these are standalone systems. And, you know, when I started working in the industry, what I really did was a lot of standalone residential systems. People buy property in the middle of nowhere, for relatively inexpensive, um, and you know, in Arizona, it was the, the property was cheap because the power lines were ten miles away, and it was going to cost you one hundred and fifty grand to run those those lines to your property. Um, so standalone off or off grid systems were just an obvious solution, and and this was a huge part of the market for 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 decades, really from the from the seventies through the nineties, and continues to be. It really is, you know, there's there's. Um, there's something very refreshing about being off grid and being your own power supply. You know, you're, you're, hopefully you're taking care of your stuff. You know, you probably have a backup generator for those times when you get guests or, or it's cloudier than normal. Um, but in general, you're running off PV that's charging batteries and you're using regular electricity like any other house, but you cut the cord and you're, and you're standing alone. You're, you're your own grid. Um, you're making it storing it and using it all, all in one location. When I started to get into PV, when I was an SEI student in 2002, um, that was really when the grid direct market was starting to grow. 
And this is, this is an inherently different type of PV system than a standalone system. This is where we have PV modules that are feeding an inverter, which then basically either offsets electricity that's being used in a house or, or in the case of, of large utility scale systems, it just pumps right into the utility grid. It's just another generating source that's supplying, supplying power to the utility grid. So this has really been the huge driver of PV growth over the last decade or so. Um, and it, it ranges from residential systems to, to uh, you know, flat, commercials, flat commercial rooftop systems. Companies like IKEA have, have giant systems on their, on their, their, their buildings in, in many different states all over the country and the world. Um, and in the last few years in particular, I've been working on a lar lot of large, what we call utility scale systems, you know, anywhere from two to 50 acres covered with PV modules that's connected directly to the utility grid. And it's, it's just, it's pumping power in there um, during the time of the day when people need it, right? You know, the daytime loads tend to be high. Businesses are up and running. People are, are getting home in the afternoons, those long summer days when people are running their air conditioner, um, the PV system's making a lot of power. So, so it's been really fascinating to watch the industry grow and, and all sectors still grow, you know, depending on where you're located. Um, one, one of these sectors may be stronger than the other. I'm in North Carolina where, um, where the utility scale market has been, been growing like crazy over the last few years. There's not a huge residential market. Other states like California, the residential market is, is, is huge. And other states, it's, it's a little more even. There's a lot of both going on. So it all depends on where you are. And some of that's driven by rebates and, and incentives and various other structures. But, but regardless, in general, the overall industry all across these different segments, including standalone, um, has been growing at a, a tremendous rate. So, U.S. electricity generation by source. This is from the uh, Energy Information Agency, uh, U.S. agency. Um, you can see that that single biggest chunk is still coal, just under 40% of our electricity generation. Natural gas coming in too, followed by nuclear. Um, if you look down there, oh, say between 7 and 9 p.m., if you're looking at a clock, you see the different renewable sources. Hydropower broken out. Typically, these are giant dams. Um, which, which have a tremendous impact in terms of flooding watersheds and those kind of things. And so, you know, that's, that's above my pay grade and that's sort of a different, completely different sector of the renewable energy industry. Geothermal and biomass, um, you know, th those, are, those are, uh, are, uh, are, are renewable applications. Biomass could, covers a wide range from, uh, you know, uh, capturing gases at landfills and burning it um, up to, um, you know, burning waste wood from from uh, from industrial processes and capturing the heat and generating electricity. Um, the the ones that we're mostly focusing on, well, wind is is a pretty big chunk, and the wind industry has grown tremendously in the, over the last decade or so. It's had some ups and downs. A lot of that being driven by what's going on with with tax credits in the U.S. as far as the U.S. market is concerned. Um, and you know, I was saying solar PV has been growing like crazy, and it's it's still just under a quarter of 1% of the total electricity generation, just the tiniest little sliver there. Um, so we're growing fast. We are installing a lot of PV, a lot of solar electricity. We're, that's not even a slice of the pie. That's a, it's barely a sliver of the pie that, that, we're, that we're at right now, um, which, you know, in one sense, boy, I'm sure it would be nice if we had uh, more of electricity coming from solar, but... At the same time, it means we've got a tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous possibilities for growth ahead in the in the coming years. <clears throat> so this is from uh, the Renewables 2013 Global Status Report, and this is just kind of breaking down uh, these same numbers, but on a on a global scale. Um, and you can see here that um, it's 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 a pretty small chunk still, right? We're looking at around 19 percent or so of the overall uh, global energy um, being being renewables and still on a global scale, oh gosh, you know, 1% or so is actually electric generation from solar. Um, we do use biomass and geothermal and hot water to, to make around 4% of our energy, but electrical generation through PV is still around 1% on a global level, still a fraction of the overall amount, but lots of room to grow. Um, 
IREC, the Interstate Renewable Energy Council, publishes a uh, market trend report every year. This is the most recent one uh, for 2013, came out early in 2014. Um, in 2012, uh, 7.4 gigawatts of, uh, of solar installed, right? So 40% growth rate over the past six years. And you can see that it's really just taken off like crazy. And part of that's been credits and demand and awareness um, and again, the, the dramatic reductions in cost that we've seen um, in terms of PV modules. So that's, that curve is going up, up and away. And I think that, you know, that puts that, uh, that little tiny sliver of the pie from the previous slides into a little bit of perspective. We are, we're making a lot of progress. We just have a long way to go still. Um, breaking down those numbers in terms of the sector, utility scale, typically large ground-mounted systems covering tens or dozens or hundreds of acres. Um, Non-residential, um, you know, these are, are commercial buildings typically. Um, you know, there's, for instance, uh, the San Francisco International Airport's got a really big system on, on top of one of the terminals there, or um, Walmart owns more PV than any other retailer in the, in the world. Um, they've got systems on lots of their buildings. So those are the non-residential applications, and then residential meaning people's homes. And you can see that um, in terms of capacity, um, everything's growing. Utilities growing faster because of um, requirements for utilities to have renewable energy generation, as well as the fact that, you know, it's very scalable and you, know, you can plop down a couple hundred megawatts of utility scale a lot faster than you can plop down you know, one megawatt of residential <laughs> because you're working on hundreds of different roofs at that point. So part of it is just how quickly can these things get done, but I think we're seeing healthy growth across all, all of these various uh, sectors of, of, of the uh, PV industry. Top 10 states, again, from the, uh, the IREC 2013 U.S. Market Trends Report. California is number one, has been number one for a long time. I guess I think they'll probably continue to be number one for a long time to come. Um, hard to say, but there, it's an interesting mix, I think, in there, too. Arizona, okay, yeah, no doubt, right? Sunny Southwest Desert, Nevada as well. But look at some of the other states mixed in here. New Jersey, Massachusetts in the Northeast, um, not what we typically think of as super sunny areas, but that just goes to show you that PV works. We have to take into consideration the fact that, hey, there's less sun here. The same PV module is going to make less energy on an annual basis as it would if it was sitting in Arizona. But we know what that we can, we can figure out what those differences are. We can crunch the numbers and we can figure out what a system makes. And, and believe me, if it didn't make sense from a financial standpoint, we wouldn't see these kinds of numbers of, of installed capacity going in because in the end, a lot of these systems have to be financed by someone, even if it's a residential system. Most people aren't paying cash. Um, larger systems financing is a huge part of a huge part of making these projects work, and and the bankers don't sign off unless the numbers make sense. Um, other states like Hawaii, you know, we see this on islands all over the world. Electricity is very expensive on islands. A lot of them use a lot of diesel generation to meet their electrical demands, and that's incredibly expensive. It has to be imported typically. Wherever electricity is expensive. Solar electricity makes even more sense than in other areas. So Hawaii has seen tremendous growth and, and it has cracked into the top 10. Um, and, you know, New York, Colorado, these are a few of the other ones that have been on the list for years. A lot of times we'll see a newcomer come in as their capacity grows dramatically if they have new programs. But a lot of these names have been on the, the list for, for several years. Um, hopefully we'll see, we'll see some changes in some other, some other markets really taken off as well in the coming years. Okay, so this is just looking at world capacity, and you can see it's, it's very much a, a similar uh, shape to the, to the U.S. installed capacity curve. Um, 100 gigawatts of installed world capacity as of uh, the end of, uh, I believe this is the end of 2012 is this data. But again, the numbers are, are growing at, at, a, at, a, at a fairly similar rate, um, and, and we're seeing that across the world. Breakdown, so Germany has been leading the world in PV for years and years and years. Um, I don't think anybody's catching up to them anytime soon. Um, I, I'm not sure on this one. Italy's number two. 
you know, if you extract California out, it on its own may be here in the top 10 or top 20 as well. United States is, is, is coming in third and has as much as, uh, as the rest of the world minus what else is broken out on this graph here. Um, you know, Germany has led this uh, for years and years, led the PV industry, been very aggressive in installing these systems. And if you look at the data, Germany gets less sun than Seattle, Washington. Right. And so Seattle, what do you think of? You think of rain, sun never shines. Germany actually has a lower solar resource than Seattle. And yet they lead the world in installed capacity. Again, it's just a matter of knowing what that system's going to make, knowing how to figure those values out and, and make those forecasts so that we can uh, you know, basically run the numbers and make sure systems make sense where we're installing them. Module manufacturers, this has been interesting. I've said several times now, hey, module prices have come down, way down. Um, and that's true. And it's come down so much to that some manufacturers have gone out of business. <laughs> they cannot make modules. Uh, they can't sell modules for more than it costs them to make them. Right? So that's a losing proposition right there. Part of this is because, because that a lot of people have gotten into the game. There's a lot more manufacturers than there have, ever has been. Um, but prices are down, and they've been down for a while, and, and they bump along a little bit. But in general, um, uh, a lot of these manufacturers are, are, are have some pretty tight margins on, on these modules that they're making. Um, you can see that a, a big chunk of the of the, the, the of the leading module manufacturers, the top 15, are based in China. China has been very aggressive in terms of um, of supporting their their PV manufacturing industry. Um, a couple of the, the biggest uh, module manufacturers and installers in the world are, are First Solar and SunPower based in the U.S. and they, they make modules and, and install them and own systems all over the world. Um, and a couple other uh, from Canada and Japan and, uh, and, and Norway. Um, but when you look at this, these are the top 15. Half of the modules out there come from somebody else. So there's a lot of manufacturers out there. Um, that some that are new, some that have been around for years, some that may not be around in a couple of years, and, and it's important to make sure that you're buying a quality product from somebody that you know and trust when you're, when you're making a module buying decision. So, one thing, beware. <laughs> there are, there's a lot of uh, unproven technology, and there's laboratory claims, and there's miracle products that are coming down the pipeline, and, and there's cell efficiencies that are through the roof, and, and there's all these questions out there. There's, you know, you, there's, hey, I'm going to be able to go buy a can of solar paint and just paint my walls with it on the outside, and, um, and my house will start making electricity. You have to be aware of the fact that what you can buy and install is very different from what you can read about and, and what you can theorize about and, and what may happen in the future. I kind of call this the popular science effect. Um, you know, where's my jet pack and my, and my robot butler, right? And, and, and it's sort of the Jetsons theme. We're, we're not quite there yet. We don't have some of these things that, that we, we were said we would have. And, you know, a lot of this stuff is, is, is ongoing research. Right, it may exist in a laboratory, and you may have a super efficient PV cell, but it's not commercially viable, or it's not being manufactured. I can't buy it, I can't install it, and you know, I, I, I'm all for. We need to do this research. We need to continually improve our our products and materials and processes. But at the same time, we're looking at designing and installing systems here and now with what. I can buy and what I can use and what's commercially available. So, so watch out for for people who are trying to sell you the world and have the latest and greatest and and uh, and, and promise things that that other systems seemingly can't do because it, it, they it may be maybe a hollow promise in the end. Um, and that's really one thing SEI focuses on. We want to make sure that we're training people to. Um, you know, keep up to date with what's coming down the pike and, 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 and always be at the forefront of, of, of the technology, but at the same time, uh, being aware of what's out there and being able to design and install high quality and efficient systems using, using the products that are available to us today. And, and again, I think it gets back to the whole banker argument again. It's like, you know, so the, a common refrain I would hear when I, was, when I was selling a lot of PV systems to people that I would then install them for, um, they would be like, well, I, you know, I heard cell efficiency is going to go up and, 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 be, and jump up in the next couple of years. And, you know, what I've seen is that cell efficiency trickles up a tiny little bit here and there over the years. But, you know, 
if if the system makes sense, if it if it does what you want it to do, if it has a uh, if it produces the energy you need to to do a particular job, or if it's cost effective, or it has a a rate of return that's acceptable based on the upfront investment, then it then then the efficiency is a little kind of goes out the window a little bit, right? And we can yeah, of course everybody wants to be the most efficient they can be, but at the same time. Um, let's look at what we've got. Let's let's look at what's what, what's realistic, and let's see if it makes sense. And and PV industry wouldn't be growing the way it is if it didn't make sense with the materials that are out there right now. So that's just a that that may have been a little bit of a ramble, but I just want you to be aware of the fact that that you'll you'll hear that a lot. It'll be the what's coming down, what's going to be the latest and greatest. Why should I why should I put a PV system in now when it's gonna you know I could get one ten years from now? Well. Maybe because in 10 years from now, the one that you bought now will have already paid for itself and, uh, you know, generated, you know, five times the electricity it cost to, or that was required to make it um, and will have had a great rate of return. So, you know, those, 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 are, those are questions that you'll encounter for sure. Or maybe questions that you even have yourself. Okay, so just a want to be a, make sure that people are aware that we're, we're really focusing on code compliant PV system design and installation. Um, we teach classes all over the world and and sometimes we will go to a country and we will customize our classes for that particular area but in general the the, the National Electrical Code which is enforced across the United States really is the most advanced code in terms of addressing um, how to install these systems. And so when we talk about code, we'll be referring to the 2011 National Electrical Code. Now, there is a 2014 National Electrical Code and, and it's out, but most states haven't adopted it yet. Um, and most states won't um, until a year or more after it comes out. So our class still focuses on 2011, which is the most widely adopted version of the NEC in the United States. Um, and SEI has additional resources um, if you are in an area that has already adopted the 2014 version, which I think is only two or three states as when I'm recording this here. In, uh, um, then we have those other resources that will allow you to, uh, to, to see what kind of changes have gone out there um, and that, that need to be addressed if you're operating under this new code. Um, now, you've got to keep in mind, this class is not going to magically transform you into an electrician, roofer, general contractor, PV module manufacturer, commercial system designer, or electrical engineer, right? That's, I guess we could call it the fine print, but it's, it's right there on the screen and it's in fairly large font, so it's not fine print. You got to realize everybody coming into this class has a different background, different experience, um, different level of knowledge about renewable energy coming into the class. Um, and you also have to realize you can only learn so much in, in, our, in, a, in, a, in a single class. Um, you'll learn a lot, but for instance, you will, unless you come into this class an electrical engineer, you most certainly will not leave this class an electrical engineer. Likewise, an electrician ha takes years and years to lear learn and hone their craft. You'll learn some stuff about electrical work, and how uh, a lot of electrical practices apply to PV systems, but by no means, unless you were an electrician when you came, by no means will you leave this class an electrician. And, and I, I, I don't want to, you know, say that to be negative, I just want to be realistic here, because what, we're, again, we're looking at is the foundation um, for designing and installing PV systems, and, and honestly, I do believe that it truly is a, a subject worthy of a lifetime of study, um, and and that, that you're always learning, you'll always be learning as you're in this industry because anything growing this fast is going to change fast too. And it, and it takes, a, it takes dedication and passion to stay on top of, on top of these changes and, and uh, stay at the forefront of the industry. Okay, so job resources. Uh, maybe you're just getting started here and, and this will be a little more applicable down the line, but I think at the same time, you know, you might you take a look and see what, what kind of jobs are out there. What were ones that you might be qualified for after some education or, or ones that you have uh, the, the kind of, the kind of jive with your background a little bit. So these are just some of the websites out there that, uh, that have job postings and, and information about the, uh, the uh, jobs available in the PV industry. So I would encourage you to take a look at those and, um, 
And when you're going through your class, please don't hesitate to ask your instructors about their experience and what jobs they've had because there really are so many different opportunities in the PV industry. It's not all just bolting modules down and, and using electrical meters and landing wires. There's, there's so many other things out there from manufacturing to sales um, to, to, to support and, and, and outreach and just kind of everything. There's, there's so many things to do. It's like any other industry. There's, there's, there's so much associated with it. And, and what I found is that the people in this industry are just amazing people that are, that, that are really passionate about it, that are really interested in it and into it and, and, and really smart. And, and, and they want to see this industry succeed and they've been at it. And, um, and uh, I welcome you to the fold and I hope that that, that becomes you one day too. So thanks for joining us.